Facts examines the FBI's role in combating terrorism and U.S. intelligence about 9-11 in his book, A Thousand Years for Revenge. This is an hour and 20 minutes. The greatest intelligence failure since Pearl Harbor, as some people have suggested, it was the greatest intelligence failure since the Trojan horse. And the question that I had that day, that night, when I knew that Chris was safe, was how could this have happened? How could this possibly have happened with the greatest intelligence apparatus on Earth? Five separate intelligence agencies, the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, etc. And could it happen again? And I think that, incredibly, two years after the fact, um, we're still asking those same two questions. Uh, uh, this book literally went to bed in uh, the middle of August. Um, that's how kind of up to the minute it is. Uh, we're toying with actually publishing it as a three-ring binder version, but uh, because events kept ex escalating. And I have a major piece at the end of the book on the invasion of Iraq and what it meant and what it will mean now for our national security. But um, I didn't go set out to focus on the FBI. I, the trail took me there. Um, I began kicking over rocks. In fact, strangely, I had been working on a film for Showtime, and this was a, a film based on uh, the story of Bradley Smith, who was a courageous uh, diplomatic security agent in the State Department. And Brad was the one that ran the, what they call the Rewards for Justice program that's set up to to give people, you know, pay bounties for people who are willing to turn in terrorists. And Brad was a remarkable man who I, I chronicle in the book, who uh, got found out he had Lou Gehrig's disease shortly after Ramzi Youssef set the original Trade Center bomb in 1993. And Brad vowed to stay alive until Youssef was brought to ground. And in fact, it was directly as a result of his program, his rewards program, that they caught Youssef. Um, so when I was working on a film that had to do with Ramzi Youssef, I was aware of one of his most notorious plots was called the Bojinka plot. And the Bojinka plot was not a 9-11 plot. It was a plot to blow up up to a dozen jumbo jets with, full of U.S. tourists as they came from Asia to the United States. On, and the way they were going to do it was to get on in two-leg hops. They would get on board, build the device, uh, smuggle, smuggle the components of the device on board, and plant the device on the 25th or 26th row right above the center fuel tank on the Boeing 747, and then get off only to have the planes blow with these people aboard hours, weeks, and months later, potentially, because he used a Casio data bank watch. Uh, when I had uh, done the movie for Showtime, I read the entire Bojinka trial transcript of 6,000 pages. And I remember that Youssef's partner, Abdul Hakim Murad, one of his lifelong friends from Kuwait, had been to four U.S. flight schools. So on the night of 9-11, or the next day, when they began talking about Islamic pilots at flight schools, when people really began to get a fix on what was going on, I went, well, wait a minute, why would a guy, uh, you know, um, train at four U.S. flight schools if he was going to get on board a plane, plant a bomb, and get off? You don't need to learn how to fly the plane for that. So I went to storage where I had the 6,000-page transcript, and I poured over it that night. And sure enough, I found that Murad, in 1991 and 92, had been to flight schools in Schenectady, New York, New Bern, North Carolina, uh, Red Bluff, California, and uh, near San Antonio, Texas, and gotten his commercial pilot's license. So that's when the wheels started turning for me, the investigative reporter. Uh, I started kicking over rocks, and my first zone of investigation was the Philippines, because that's where Youssef was essentially unraveled. His, uh, his four-year terror spree pretty much ended in Manila. He was ultimately captured a month later in Islamabad, but Manila was the center. So I went to the Philippines, and I was able to get the most extensive interview ever with Colonel Rodolfo Mendoza. And he is this brilliant uh, Philippine National Police investigator who interrogated Murad over 67 days in 1995. And when I met Colonel Mendoza, he began to, you know, you have to get the trust of these people. And little by little, he kind of opened up. And he told me a story that I th was incredible. He said the night of 9-11, he was in northern Philippines where he has his office now, and he's filling out a routine report. And this is 13 hours ahead, time zone from New York City. So at the moment, uh, r moments after the 9-11 attack, a friend of his text messaged him frantically on his Nokia that said, urgent, turn on CNN, turn on CNN. So he turns on CNN, and his eyes go wide as he sees the South Tower of the Trade Center collapsing. The first words out of his mouth, he calls his friend immediately, they have done it, they have done it. Done, d they have done it. In other words, you knew about this ahead of time, Colonel Mendoza? Not only did we know about it ahead of time, we told the U.S. Embassy in Manila all of this in April of 1995. I came out of the Philippines that day, and uh, 
a few days later, and it was perhaps one of the most dangerous things I've ever done because the day I left, 14 people were killed by an Al-Qaeda-related bomb in the southern Philippines. Uh, virtually every building at that point, every store I went into, there was an armed guard. Uh, and uh, Colonel Mendoza, we just to go up to meet Colonel Mendoza, we had a bulletproof car with a special armored driver and we circled Manila for like two, an hour in the early in the morning to make sure we weren't being followed. And uh, he, he gave me over 200 pages of formally classified documents. In fact, I shipped uh, a set of them to a friend of mine here in Santa Barbara, just in case somehow they were, you know, a, somebody picked them up at customs as I came in. And as I began to look through these pages, my jaw began to drop. And it was the first in a series of stunning revelations to me that, in fact, this plot, this 9-11 plot that Ramzi Youssef had, execute, had, had conceived and was ultimately executed by his uncle Khalid Sheikh was thoroughly in motion in, in uh, December of 1994. They had six targets chosen, including on both coasts of the United States, including the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, CIA headquarters in Langley, um, a nuclear facility, the Sears Tower, and the Transamerica Tower in San Francisco were the original targets. They had 10 Islamic pilots in 1994 training in U.S. flight schools. And uh, initially there had been a report that there had only been a plane to, plan to fly a small plane into the CIA. And after 9-11, Condoleezza Rice and a number of people in the White House said, well, how could we have ever extrapolated 9-11 from a small plane? In fact, that was what uh, Murad told Boogie Mendoza in the early days of interrogation. But little by little, he peeled away the layers and he confessed to this extraordinarily intricate plot that was well in motion in, in 1994, six years before 9-11. So then, when I had that information, I said to myself, well, could they have stopped Ramzi Ahmed Youssef in the fall of 1992 as he built in Jersey City the 1,500-pound ammonium nitrate fuel oil device that he planted on the B-2 level between the Twin Towers? And it was his original intent, we now know, to actually have the Tower 1 collapse into Tower 2. He told the FBI after his capture that he wanted to kill 250,000 people. That was his intent. He wanted a Hiroshima-like event. And when he did not achieve that, in fact, he literally, after that, uh, after they escaped from the garage, after he planted the bomb, he stood over in Jer Jersey City on a, on a bench and looked over at the tower burning, the, uh, the North Tower, and basically was, was very upset that he had not achieved this goal. And that night, and this is something I found in my research, that night from Kennedy Airport, he apparently called in uh, a coda to the original threat letter that was typed on the computer of one of his conspirators. One of the conspirators was named uh, Nidal Ayad. He was a Kuwaiti, a Rutgers grad, and he had typed the threat letter, uh, uh, which Yusef called his group the 5th Battalion of the Liberation Army, and they took credit. They mailed five letters as they sped away from the Trade Center, and the New York Times got the letter and published it a month later. Well, Yusef, so upset that he did not achieve his original goal, added a coda that was later found by the FBI on the computer of Nadel Ayad, and I'm paraphrasing, but it basically said, we know what we did wrong, we will be back to finish the job. And the FBI had that in March of 1993, okay? Anyway, so I then went back and I discovered for the first time the story of Special Agent Nancy Floyd, which is an extraordinary story. And I, I, after speaking for a few minutes, I would like, if you don't mind, to read some of my book and give you an idea of who Nancy Floyd was. And as I began to unpeel her story, I then found out about another investigator, uh, Ronnie Buka. And Ronnie Buka was a fire marshal in the FDNY who had been an ex-Green Beret, and he was a paratrooper in addition to being a firefighter. He had a spectacular fall in 1986 where he was in Rescue One, which is like the Green Berets of the fire departments, the, the oldest and greatest heavy rescue company in the world. And they go in and support the fire suppression units. That's their job. They move the hose. They look for bodies, civilians, and members of service. Anyway, they do seven to 900 working fires a year. They do all the high-rise rescue. If a helicopter crashes in the East River, they're all scuba trained. They're amazing. So this was Ronnie Buka's unit in New York. And in 1986, he fell five stories when he was attempting to rescue a lieutenant who was trapped on the fourth floor of a tenement. He was not expected to live. And uh, yet, in one year, and he could have retired on a three-quarter tax-free pension at the age of 32. Now, how many, of, we all would have, you know, raised your hand if most people would have done that. And yet, Ronnie Buchan not only vowed to return to the fire department, but he return, vowed to return to West Rescue One. And in one year, he got back to Rescue One, which is a rocky story and a book in itself. 
So he was known in the fire department as the flying firefighter. He was a legend in the FDNY. And after he, um, he hurt his back, he always had an active duty military uh, uh, army reserve presence. And he was a paratrooper. That's what he used to do on weekends, jump out of planes with the 101st Airborne. Now, when he hurt his back, he put in for military intelligence. And he was in a unit that was one of four units in the entire country tasked to support DIAC, which is the Defense Intelligence Analysis Center at Bowling Air Force Base in Washington. In DC. So it's that was, if you will, the CIA of the Pentagon. In other words, it was the it's the, they call the building the Death Star. And that and so on weekends, Ronnie Buka was looking at intelligence that and he saw what had happened to Special Agent Nancy Floyd, although they had never met. And because he had lost uh, almost lost his best friend, Kevin Shea, another firefighter from Rescue One, who fell into the four-story pit that Yusef created with that bomb that day in '93. Ronnie went to see him that night in the hospital and he said, I'm well we're gonna be involved in this don't worry because we're fire marshals and he'd become a fire marshal and obviously it's the greatest arson fire in New York history we must of course they're gonna use us well in fact the FBI except for two marshals excluded these experienced investigators from the from the hunt and Ronnie Buka on his own began his own journey of investigation and what he did was he would work mutual back-to-back 12-hour -back shifts. Imagine 24 hours straight so he could stay in the city, sleep in a firehouse, go to the New York Public Library, and educate himself about Islamic terrorism. And he got a self-taught master's degree very quickly. And he then came upon this, um, uh, this statement that was on the computer that I told you about and began telling people years ago, as early as 1993, they're coming back, they're coming back, a modern-day Paul Revere. Well, Ronnie Buka in 1999, after being spurned by the, FD, uh, the FBI, they have a, a group in New York called the Joint Terrorist Task Force. It's the oldest one in the country, and the whole idea of it is to have seasoned law enforcement agents, local cops and law investigators, work with the FBI. And the, uh, Irani applied, but because he was a fire marshal, they kind of spurned him. There's, a, there's an inherent um, tribal warfare in New York between the Reds and the Blues that has gone on for decades. And, and he was spurned. He was not admitted. So he he had to do this from afar. In 1999, in Metrotech, which is the brand new headquarters of the fire department in Brooklyn, he came across evidence that an Egyptian uh, uh, naturalized citizen who'd been working as a, an accountant in the FDNY for, for 25 years that may have been an Al-Qaeda mole inside the fire department, he found out that this man was an intimate of blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. And in a minute, I'll explain who the blind Sheikh is and, and, and how he fits in this story for over 12 years. And Ronnie found out also that this individual had obtained the plans of the World Trade Center prior to the bombing. This guy got the blueprints of the World Trade Center prior to the bombing. He lied to get a second ID to Metrotech in 1999, which would have allowed someone else access to this building that has the plans of virtually every building in New York City. And Ronnie brought this to the FBI and they, and they spurned him. They basically, you know, Again, he was rejected. I don't want to finish what happened to Ronnie till we get to the, to the end of this discussion tonight. But basically what I, what I decided to do with this book is to use the personal story of uh, Ramzi Youssef, the Mozart of Terror, the personal story of Ronnie Buka, and the personal story of Nancy Floyd, and weave them together as I, as I lay out the evidence in this book. And essentially, that's what A Thousand Years for Revenge is. The title comes from an expression in Ramzi Youssef's home province of Baluchistan. And they say, if it takes me 10 centuries to kill my enemy, I will wait a thousand years for revenge. And that's what we're up against. That's, that's part of what defines the Al-Qaeda threat to this country. So if you don't mind, I'll, uh, okay, I'll um, just read a couple of things from the book. And, uh, Hope, hope I don't mess up the microphone here. Can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Okay. Um, chapter 1, Black Tuesday. On the morning of September 11, 2001, the greatest would-be mass murderer since Adolf Hitler was locked down in solitary confinement in a Colorado prison. In a 7 by 12 foot cell at the Supermax, the most secure of all federal jails, Ramzi Youssef sat waiting like a bird of prey. Small, gaunt, and reed-thin with close-cropped hair and two milky gray eyes, he looked across his cell at the stainless steel toilet and sink below a shelf supporting a 13-inch television. It was Yusef's only link to the outside world. As CNN played silently in the background, his eyes darted across the dog-eared pages of his Koran. Yusef may not have known the precise moment of the attacks, but he was sure they would come. 
After all, he'd set them in motion seven years before in Manila. The idea of hijacking jetliners laden with fuel and using them as missiles to take down great buildings had come to the bomb maker after he tried to kill a quarter of a million people with his first Twin Towers device in 1993. He'd gone on to plot the deaths of President Clinton, Pope John Paul II, and the Prime Minister of Pakistan while hatching a fiendish plot to destroy up to a dozen jumbo jets as they flew over American cities. But his most audacious plot involved the return to New York to finish the job he'd started in the fall of 92. In one horrific morning, suicide bombers trained as pilots would take the cockpits aboard a series of commercial airliners and drive them into the Trade Center, the Pentagon, and a series of other U.S. buildings. Now, just before 6.45 a.m. Mountain Time, as Ramzi Youssef sat in the supermax reading the Koran, he heard muffled noises on the cell block inmate shouting. One of the prisoners down the corridor had been watching CNN and now he was screaming. A guard rushed to his cell, went inside and saw the devastation. He yelled, some plane just hit the trade center. Yusef quickly looked up at the black and white TV above his head. Eyes wide at the sight of the North Tower burning, he turned up the sound and heard the voice of an eyewitness. I just saw the entire top part of the World Trade Center explode. Yusef rocked back amazed himself at the execution of his plan. He stared at the news footage of racing FDNY engines, terrified evacuees and bodies dropping from the towers. Then from the battery, a camera captured UA-175 slamming into the South Tower. Another onlooker described it as a sickening sight, but Youssef, the master terrorist, saw it as the culmination of a dream and the end of some unfinished business. He dropped to the floor, bent over and gave thanks. Praise Allah, the merciful and the just, the Lord of the worlds. We thank you for delivering us delivering this message to the apostates. Now we cut to Nancy Floyd. I could not have made this up where she experienced 9-11. I could not have even conceived of this as fiction. She had come within weeks of breaking Youssef's bomb cell in the fall of 92, but her investigation had been shut down by a bureau superior in New York. Now, just before 9 a.m., as she drove west across the George Washington Bridge on her way to an off-site surveillance assignment, Agent Floyd heard a report on her car radio about an explosion at the Trade Center. She hit the brakes. Dozens of cars in front of her skidded to a stop, and traffic on both sides of the bridge ground to a halt as the morning commuters all heard the news. Nancy shoved her gun into a holster on her belt, threw a jacket on, and got out of the car. She quickly crossed the center median and moved with dozens of other onlookers to the south side of the bridge. Down the Hudson River, at the tip of Lower Manhattan, smoke billowed up from the North Tower. Nancy listened to a radio broadcast from a nearby car. It was still early in the attack, and the onlookers around her were speculating. Are they sure it's a plane? Maybe a gas leak? Standing there, though, on the bridge, the 41-year-old special agent from Texas knew in her gut what it was, an attack by Middle Eastern terrorists, and not just any attack, but one hatched in the brilliant but deadly mind of Ramzi Youssef. Minutes later, UA-175 roared across the river from New Jersey. For a moment, it looked as if the 767 was pointed toward the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. Then it turned to the left and slammed into the upper floors of the South Tower. Back in 1992, through Imad Salem, an Egyptian informant she'd recruited, Nancy Floyd had come so close to the men around Youssef she could almost smell them. By then, Ramzi Youssef was hard at work in an apartment in Jersey City building the 1,500-pound urea nitrate fuel oil device he would plant on the B-2 level between the towers. Now, Nancy watched those towers as they burned, knowing that though he'd been in federal lockup since 1995, this was somehow the fulfillment of Youssef's plan. For Agent Floyd, it was a vindication, but she took little comfort in the thought. Her attempt to expose the first Trade Center plot had almost ended her career. Only now, years later, she'd be begun to recover. She'd put in to, for a transfer to a small FBI regional office in the far west. Her request had been granted, and now Nancy was only 18 days away from leaving New York. Long ago, she tried to bury thoughts of Yusuf in the 93 bombing, but now she couldn't stop thinking about him, especially after a call she'd received that past August from her old informant, Imad Salem. He'd been in the Federal Witness Protection Program ever since testifying against the seller on Yusuf and Sheikh Abdel Rahman. Largely on Salem's word, the blind Sheikh had been convicted of a plot to blow up a series of New York landmarks, including the tunnels leading into Manhattan and the very bridge that Nancy Floyd was now standing on. But years before, Floyd had been prohibited by the Bureau from taking Salem's calls or even discussing the details of the original bombing with him. In all, in all the years since, even when Salem had been diagnosed with cancer in 1998, Nancy had never broken the silence. Then, a few weeks before 9-11, she was working an FBI undercover assignment when Salem sent word that he wanted to talk to her. They never connected. 
so she never heard what he had to say. Now, as she stood watching the towers burn, Nancy felt a cold throb at the base of her spine. Could Ahmad have been calling to warn me about this, she wondered? She would never know. Only in the summer of 2002, months after the attacks, did Nancy Floyd become aware that another investigator had been on a parallel course. Along with the word tragedy, September 11th was the day the word hero took on new meaning. For the FDNY, the statistics were numbing. 343 members of service lost their lives. 95 firefighters in the department's Special Operations Command was wiped, were wiped out. Rescue One, the preeminent heavy rescue company in the world, lost 11 men in a house of 25. September 11th was a day full of terrible ironies, but one of the cruelest involved a man who was already a bona fide legend in the FDNY 15 years before he ever roared down to Liberty Street and raced up the stairs of the South Tower. Ronnie Buka was a 47-year-old fire marshal with the FDNY's Bureau of Fire Investigation. A veteran firefighter himself, he had investigated the original bombing in 93 and had come away convinced that the perpetrators would return to finish the job. Over the next six years, as he educated himself on Islamic fundamentalism, Buka found himself continually frustrated by the FBI's inability to appreciate the bin Laden threat or share the intelligence. Despite the fact that he had a top secret security clearance as a warrant officer in a high-level Army Reserve Intelligence Unit, Buka was repeatedly frozen out by members of the NYPD-FBI Joint Terrorist Task Force, one of the key bureau units hunting Yousef. His frustration reached a fever pitch in 1999 after he uncovered evidence, startling evidence, that an Egyptian with direct ties to the blind sheikh was actually working inside the FDNY headquarters. Now, astonishingly, on that morning, as Nancy Floyd watched from the George Washington Bridge, Ronnie Buka was on the 78th floor of the South Tower with a hose in his hand, trying to beat back the flames. <clears throat> it's hard for me to... Hard for me to think about what happened to Ronnie, but I'll talk to you in, uh, in, uh, when we get to the end. I'm going to just read one more chapter and then uh, talk a little bit more. And then I, this is really an open forum, and I appreciate C-SPAN doing this, but I'd love to get the input from you guys and get your questions. <clears throat> uh, this is chapter four. I'm just skipping ahead. Much has been made of the alleged links between the September 11th attacks in two Middle Eastern countries, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. A primary motivation for the U.S. invasion in March of 2003 was the allegation that Saddam Hussein's regime was tied to the terrorist network that executed 9-11. In fact, as we'll see, the connection between al-Qaeda and the old Baghdad regime were limited and tenuous. Saudi Arabia, however, was another story. Fifteen of the 9-11 hijackers were Saudis. A mini-scandal erupted in November 2002 when it was learned that money from the wife of the Saudi ambassador to the U.S. found its way through a San Diego-based charity to two of the hijackers. The very same charitable entity that evolved into al-Qaeda had begun as a fundraising conduit during the Afghan war in which the Saudis matched the U.S. contributions dollar for dollar. And though his roots were in Yemen, Osama bin Laden himself is the scion of a family whose multi-billion dollar construction empire built much of Saudi Arabia's infrastructure. But the record now shows that if the Islamic dissidents of any Arab country had a major role in the attacks of 9-11, it was Egypt. After a bitter dispute for control of the multi-billion million dollar Afghan rebel fundraising network, it was an Egyptian bloc that first helped Osama bin Laden cement his position at the top of the jihad power structure. Both of bin Laden's chief lieutenants came from Egypt. The spiritual leader of the two Islamic extremist groups associated with them is Egyptian. In fact, the first known shots in al-Qaeda's war on America were fired largely by Egyptian immigrants at a rifle range in Calvert and Long Island on four successive weekends in July of 1989. Now that's how far we take the trail to 9-11. I just want to digress one moment to show you that one of the things I did in writing this book, and I wrote this book because I had been on my own self-taught master's degree for the last two years and I wanted to write a book that would quickly bring Americans up to speed on this al-Qaeda threat and I wanted the book to be simple not just a historical you know polemic so what I did was and because many of the names are complicated and they use multiple aliases I created a timeline that is in the middle of the book and the timeline is essentially 32 pages and I don't know if you can get a shot George but anyway uh, the timeline traces 
is the line going back to 1989 all the way up through 9-11. And what you end up seeing is the same faces time and time again show up on this line. And when you, after a while you go, how did the FBI miss this? I mean, it's, it's just extraordinary. The visual picture is amazing. The timeline also is keyed to the text in the book. So you can, if you're reading and you lose a place and you forget where does this fit in the big picture, you go back to the timeline. Uh, but the first major dot on the timeline happened in this result of this surveillance in 1989. Back then, blasting away with AK-47 assault rifles, 9mm semi-automatic handguns, and 357 magnums was a rogues gallery of terrorists in training. They included Mahmoud Abu Alima, the Egyptian emigre said to have interfaced with Ramzi Youssef on the Afghan-Pakistani border in 1989. Since coming to New York, Abu Alima had taken a job as a city taxi driver. El Sayed Nosser, born in Port Said, Egypt, a 34-year-old Prozac-popping maintenance man, Nosser worked in the basement of the Manhattan civil court building. And Mohammed Salema, a Palestinian born in Jordan. Salema was re related to Nosser's cousin, an Egyptian named Ibrahim al Gabrani. There were two non-Egyptians, Nidel Ayad, the, the Rutgers grad I told you had typed the threat letter, and Rodney Clement Hampton L., an American black Muslim, who also reportedly fought in Afghanistan. Now, what's astonishing here is their leader was a guy named Ali Muhammad. And Ali Muhammad was an ex-Egyptian army officer who was in the same unit that was associated with the murder of Anwar Sadat in 1981. But he didn't never got indicted because he had a good alibi. At the time, he was advising the U.S. Special Warfare School, the Green Berets at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Okay? And years later, even though the CIA wouldn't touch him because he was considered so dirty, when he left the Egyptian army, he somehow found his way to the United States, married a woman from Oakland, became a naturalized citizen, enlisted in the U.S. Army, became a sergeant, and was now back working at Fort Bragg in the middle of the Green Beret Special Warfare School. And on weekends, he was coming up to New York and training these guys in paramilitary training. Of the men in this session, in July of 1989, three would be convicted in the World Trade Center bombing. Nosser would go on to kill right-wing Rabbi Meir Kahani in 1990. Two of them would plot the bridge and tunnel plot with the Sheikh, convicted in 95. And Ali Muhammad himself would go on to train Osama bin Laden's personal bodyguard. And later, he scouted the African embassies. Nine years later, in Africa, he scouted these embassies and actually took the pictures, and bin Laden showed him where to put the bombs. 234 dead, 5,000 injured, nine years later. This was the first dot on the FBI's chart, going back that, that far. Um, anyway, um, beginning in the weekend of July 2nd, the FBI Special Operations Group was assigned to watch a series of MEs who hung out at the El Kifar Refugee Center at the El Farouk Mosque on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. MEs in bureau parlance were Middle Eastern men. Special Agent James Fogel, a 10-year veteran, was the photographer. And essentially what he did was they shot dozens and dozens of pictures over these four weekends. And then, for mysterious reasons, the investigation was shut down. Okay? So you could say maybe, okay, well, they didn't have any perspective back then. They didn't really know who these men were. As mysterious as this was at the time, you could say, okay, let's let it go. But then, cut to November 5th, 1990. Rabbi Kahani is in the, uh, a ballroom at the Marriott Hotel on Lexington Avenue. He's just finished a speech when suddenly El Sayed Nasser, posing as a Sephardic Jew, rushes forward, shoots him twice in the neck with, a, with the same 9 millimeter that he trained with at Calverton, rushes out into the street. A gun battle on Lexington Avenue ensues. There happened to be a postal worker. He fired a shot. Nasser is wounded. They rush Nasser and the rabbi to Bellevue Hospital to the trauma unit where they're worked on in parallel stalls. The, the rabbi dies, Nosser lives. That night, the, the New York Police Department and the FBI went to Nosser's house in New Jersey. They found Mahmoud Abolima, the big red-headed Egyptian that I just described from Calvert, and, and Mohammed Salema, the Palestinian, waiting. They were supposed to be the getaway drivers. But that wasn't enough. They took them into custody as material witnesses. But they found 47 boxes of evidence, which included uh, 1,400 rounds of ammunition, bomb recipes, pictures of the World Trade Center, speeches of the Sheikh, both recorded and translated, that said we need to take down the edifices of capitalism, the high world buildings. Uh, they also found top secret manuals from Fort Bragg, from the Special Warfare School, uh, top secret memos from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
um, and basically pictures of the Trade Center. If they had been a flashing arrow pointing at the World Trade Center that night and, and a sign that said international conspiracy, it couldn't have been more obvious. But what happened? The NYPD's chief of detectives, Joe Borelli, the man credited with bringing down the son of Sam, decided uh, that this was a lone gunman case. They wanted to avoid a political show trial after Nocer lawyered up with William Con Counselor is his lawyer. They oh, we don't. This is the Jewish capital of, of America. We don't want to have a big uh, political trial and give these guys a, a voice. So what they did was they basically tried this as a lone gunman shooting. Those 47 boxes of evidence shifted back and forth between the bureau and the NYPD to the point where the chain of evidence was broken, and the opportunity was lost. Okay, enter Special Agent Nancy Floyd, full of, you know what, and vinegar. I don't know what what you're allowed to say on C-SPAN. She's from Texas. She's bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. She worked in Savannah. She qualified for SWAT on her first assignment. She comes to New York City. She's working in the Foreign Counterintelligence Unit, the GRU unit. Her job is to focus on Red Army Intelligence, the Russians at the UN. Follow them around. Make sure they're not you know, getting into trouble. And one of her one assignments, she happened to go to a hotel at 55th and Broadway and met a security guard. And the security guard was this fellow Salem, an ex-Egyptian army officer. And he did a number of jobs for her, gave her good intelligence, proved his reliability. And then one day he said to her, you know, there's a man in this city who is so much more dangerous than the worst KGB hood. She goes, who? She he says, blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. And she writes it down. And she, you know, she knew nothing, but Nancy was a quick study, and bang, she immediately got up to speed. She went to her bosses and said, I think we have an opportunity here. This guy is amazing. Why don't we let him quit his job? He's making $500 a week. Let's see if he can go undercover as an asset. Now, this is very important. An asset in the FBI was an undercover informant, if you will, that never had to testify, didn't have to wear a wire, was never going to be public. And the whole idea of these men or women that did this job was that they would look for the threat. And then if they determined a threat was there, then the FBI goes in and does traditional surveillance, Title III wiretap warrants. They Maybe they duke another agent in who can testify, etc. So long story short, Ahmad Salam, they give him six weeks. He quits his job. They're paying him $500 a week. They give him six weeks. Maybe he can infiltrate the cell. He does it in two days. Within weeks, he's traveling to Detroit with the blind sheikh who's asking him to kill President Mubarak of Egypt. When the New York Times shoots pictures of the blind sheikh, this little guy in his arm as his new bodyguard is Ahmad Salam, the FBI informant. Within weeks later, he's going up to Attica where Nocer is now in prison, the killer of Kahani, and he's saying, I want you to blow up 12 Jewish locations around New York City, a bombing because I want you to kill the judge who sentenced me. I want you to blow up the Diamond District. And, you know, he's playing along because he wants to understand how deep the threat goes. Long story short, Nancy, he comes to Nancy and, they, and, they, and he t describes this. Now, the next move would have been naturally to do the surveillance I described. But all of a sudden, a new head of terrorism takes over. There was no head of terrorism. Nancy was not in the terrorism branch. And this new guy that came in, Carson Dunbar, had been an administrative special agent in charge. He was the paper guy in the office, right? He was the guy that you went to to approve your overtime and things like that. Not overtime, because they don't get it in the bureau, but to approve surveillance and other measures. Long story short, he does not like Nancy Floyd. It's like a personality thing. He doesn't trust Imad Salem. And he basically meets him in New York and demands that he come to 26 Federal, by the way. Way, where he's undercover. Nancy's like, sir, you know, I mean, you know, the man's under. No, I want him here. So he meets him in his office and immediately says, you have to wear a wire, you have to take a polygraph, essentially you have to re-audition for the part. Now, this man's been risking his life for months for this country for $500 a week, okay? And he basically says, I cannot, I have family in Egypt, I have to withdraw. They, let, they gave him three months to withdraw to wean himself so he could get a new job. In the fall now of 1992, now that he's out, suddenly the 12 Jewish locations plot morphs into the World Trade Center bombing conspiracy. And they bring in, blind Sheikh calls Pakistan, and Ramzi Youssef comes in on September 1st, slips into the country. You know, basically, it's a long story, it's in the book, and it basically is allowed to get into the country uh, claiming political asylum, okay? He's now in Jersey City building this 1,500 pound bomb. Salem knows there's something going on, he just doesn't know what, because he's withdrawn, he's backed away. He meets with Nancy at the Subway Sandwich Shop near 26 Federal Plaza in the fall of 92 to get his last $500 payment, and he says to her, Nancy, I beg you, you must follow Mahmoud Abulima, the, it's the six foot two Egyptian I mentioned, in Salema. There's something going on. If you follow them, they will lead you to whatever it is. And she says, look, Ahmad, I've been, I, I've been, I've been told I'm out of this, you know, I'm like on something else. And, you know, Carson doesn't trust you. He's not going to approve surveillance. I'm sorry, you know. And he says, if you do not do this, 
Don't call me when the bombs go off. He said bombs with an S. The night after the bombing that killed six, seven if you include the unborn child of Monica Smith, and injured a thousand and basically did four, half a billion in damage to the Trade Center, the FBI frantically brings Ahmad Salem back into the fold. And they end up paying him $1.5 million dollars to do what he could have done for 500 a week in the fall of 92. And he sets up in two months an undercover operation that stings the Sheikh and 11 others in the plot to blow up the bridges and tunnels. In, in two months, they could have done the exact thing in the fall of 92. And if they had, because Ramzi Youssef designed 9-11, they would have stopped the original Trade Center and they would have stopped 9-11. Okay? Did Nancy Floyd get the corner office in the Hoover Building as a result of this kind of good work? Did they give her a cash bonus as they do in the FBI? Did she get promoted? Did she go up the peck? No. They opened an internal affairs investigation on her called an OPR. And the average OPR in 1993 lasted three to four months. Hers lasted five and a half years. And in the end, because they needed a scapegoat, because they needed somebody to blame, and she was the junior agent, Special Agent Nancy Floyd was suspended for two weeks. They took her badge and her gun and they put her on the street. It's hard for me to say this without getting a little uh, emotional about it. And Nancy Floyd was suspended for insubordination to Carson Dunbar. It was her word against his, and he was the senior man. Carson Dunbar ended up getting promoted to run the New Jersey State Police, and he got an extraordinary sweetheart deal where he was allowed to transfer to ATF in Washington to preserve his federal pension, not have to show up, and they paid the ATF salary and the Jersey State Police salary. He was allowed these perks, and Nancy Floyd was kicked out of the bureau for two weeks and humiliated. And before they did that, they leaked a story to the New York Post headline, The Temptress and the Spy, in which they suggested that she was having an affair with Salem, which is the only reason she got this. Vilified in the tabloid press, humiliated, prevented from advancing in the bureau for five and a half years, and ultimately suspended. That's the lesson that young agents get when they hear the story of Special Agent Nancy Floyd. That's part of the problem that's, that we face today with the FBI. Anyway, um, I don't know where we are, uh, what our time is, but George, how are we doing? We're doing fine. Okay, um, I just want to tell that last, finish the story of Ronnie Buka, and then we could open it up for, for, for questions. Ronnie Buka, as I said, was this modern day Paul Revere, and he had been telling people for, for years, and not only, I interviewed a fire marshal, he actually told this man, what they're going to do is they're going to come in and hit one building, and then when emergency services is in place, they're going to hit another building. And one of the, the problems with the, the loss of life of the fire department on 9-11, the reason it was so catastrophic, was the timing of the attacks. They, somebody knew that the FBI tour change was at 9 a.m. in the morning. And they also understood the culture of the fire department. These men and women, but pr the pr principally men in the rescue units, do not misfires okay they so all the men from the night unit that had been working all night on the tour they jumped on those rigs because they didn't want to miss that fire and all the guys from the day tour coming in jumped on the rigs so the loss of life was twice what it would have been if the planes had hit at 11 a.m. do you understand okay somebody knew how the fire department worked so here's Ronnie Buka in the fall of 1999 having been spurned by the bureau having told everybody they're coming back to the point where people are laughing at him. Oh, come on, Ronnie. That, that building's locked down so tight, Janet Reno couldn't get in the, into the basement. What are you talking about? Mark my words, they're coming back. He said it to the point where a month before 9-11, he, on his own time, went and talked to one of the security guys. Are there any new means of entrance or egress that, say, could come into this building? That's how beautifully obsessed Ronnie Buka was, okay? Now we're at September of 99, and for nine months they allowed him to work at Metrotech, this new headquarters, focusing on terrorism. And one day he's in a cubicle in a bullpen doing some paperwork, and these other two fire marshals are talking about this uh, accountant who uh, claims he lost his ID. Ahmed Amin Rafai, this is, and, and, and it's, something's wrong. This guy claims he's lost his ID. Now, Metrotech is this incredibly secure building where you have to swipe your ID at every floor to get in because they have, as I said, the plans of all the city buildings. So um, this guy, Rafai, had been working there for 25 years, claimed he lost his ID on the PATH train to New Jersey. Now, when you lose your ID, you have to tell the fire marshals immediately. It's like, like losing a platinum American Express card, okay? So the fire marshals look at this, and there's nothing wrong about the timing, etc. And they asked him if he filed a loss access card report, which you're supposed to, and he, and he claimed that he did. The next morning they, they came in and they found a lost access card report filled out 
signed by the name of a fire marshal, was on vacation at the time, the date of the signal. So he forged a lost access. He went to a lot of trouble. And they're talking about this, and Ronnie, and they, some guy, one of the marshals said to the other, yeah, he was an Egyptian. And Ronnie's like, did you say Egyptian? <laughs> you know, because Ronnie had been studying blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, the Egyptian cleric, and he knew about Calvert in 89, he knew about Nasser, he knew about all these events that I've described for you tonight. So he said, would you mind if I helped out on this? No, come on, Ronnie. So they go and they get the video, and they look at the video, and they find out that not only is the guy lying, he claimed he wasn't in on a certain day, he actually snuck in, he had the ID in his wallet, and he moved up against the card reader, against the wall of the building, and passed in front of it, and that's how he got in. So they caught him in like almost a dozen lies. He lied about his children, he lied about where he was from, he lied about his date of birth. It just was weird, it didn't, it didn't sink. So Ronnie went to interview his boss, Kay Ellis Woods, who's now deputy commissioner, assistant deputy commissioner, and she, and they, he, they, he said, was there anything unusual about this guy? And she said he was kind of like a ghost employee, he never, he would always come in late, he would take all the overtime, all the days off, and uh, you know, I find him asleep at his desk sometimes, etc. But uh, anything else? No, I can't think of anything. So Ronnie's about to leave and she goes, wait a minute, there was that time with the blueprints. And he goes, what? She goes, yeah, we were moving some old file cabinets and the inspectors had been in this area and we were just tossing out these old plans from different old buildings in the city. And I came back from lunch and he was rifling through the dumpsters and he asked me if he could take the plans. Said, what were the plans, says Ronnie? The blueprints of the World Trade Center. So uh, Ronnie then went into overdrive and began looking at this guy. And somebody at the FDNY had said, you know, we saw him once. There was a picture of the blind shake, the video, the TV. We saw this guy in the crowd. So Ronnie, not knowing if he was just a little pea in the side of a shot with 100 heads, went up to Channel 7 and Eyewitness News in New York, called in a favor from a Sicilian buddy of his who was a, 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 an editor. And the guy gave him like a half a dozen cassettes. And he didn't, he didn't even begin to think that he would see the guy. On the fourth cassette, he sees this guy, Ahmed Amin Rafai, on the arm of the blind sheikh, leading him through a crowd, whispering to him like he's his handler, like he's his bodyguard. This guy, to give you an idea of the blind sheikh, the blind sheikh was in Afghanistan, as I said, helped bin Laden take over this network, came to New York City, and I believe participated in the murder of another Egyptian in order to take over this El Kifa Center in 1991, which became an Al Qaeda outpost in New York. Then he plots to blow up the bridges and tunnels around Manhattan. When he's in jail. He was still running the El Gama Islamiyah, one of the most virulent Al-Qaeda-related terror groups in the world. This is the group that killed the 58 tourists in Luxor in 1997. Men, women, and children slaughtered. Their bodies were cut open, and by then the sheikh was in prison, and they inserted leaflets inside their bodies that said, free the blind sheikh. This will give you an idea of who Sheikh Rahman was, okay? Now here is this man, an employee of the fire department, on the man's arm, whispering in his ear. Ronnie has proof that he's lied to get a second ID, and he obtained the plans of the Trade Center. Wouldn't you think the FBI would be interested in that? Keep in mind that in 1999, while this is happening, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is now in Hamburg, Germany with Mohammed Atta and Ramzi bin al Shida, and they're perfecting the 9-11 plot. They're moving forward with it. What could have happened if the FBI had focused on this, looked at the Sheikh's relationship to bin Laden? Could it have opened some more doors? Okay. We'll never know because the FBI basically blew Ronnie off. They blew him off a second time. They, a second time on 9-11, I want to tell you what happened on the morning of 9-11 something he'd prepared his whole life for. He, uh, one of the marshals described, he said, it sounded like a dumpster hitting a pothole. And they were at Manhattan base, which is where the fire marshals are, which is 15 blocks north of the trade center. Now the fire marshals are not fire suppressors. They, he didn't have to go into that building, but he ran up to the roof, he saw the smoke and he knew. And, he, and his boss, Jimmy Devery, is uh, actually senior to him, and they jumped in the car, lights and sirens, down to Liberty Street. Now, Liberty Street is a street below the South Tower, where 10 and 10 is, 10 engine and 10 truck. By then, they had already exited, and they were fighting the flames in the North Tower. Just as Ronnie and Jimmy get out of the car, put on their turnout coats and their Karen's helmets and their boots, boom, the UA-175 hits the South Tower. Ronnie Buka knew those towers like the house he grew up in. And he said, we're going. And even though Jimmy was his boss, he, he followed Ronnie because he knew. So Ronnie takes the stairs two at a time. He's in great shape. Jimmy is almost exhausted. He gets to the 51st floor. He's virtually dead. 
a, hap a woman happened to come down named Lynn Young, badly burned from the 70th floor, and, he, and Jimmy took her down, literally, as he's taking her out through the corridor, bodies are dropping left and right. He gets her to safety, okay? Now, Ronnie Buca, and we know this because of tapes recovered, and the New York Times actually had a story in August of 2002, Voices from the 78th Floor, in which they described Ronnie Buca and a battalion chief named Oriel Palmer as having gotten up to the 78th floor higher than any firefighter in either building that day. They had charged a standpipe hose, they had pressure, and they were fighting the flames when they died with their boots on. After his remains were discovered a month later, and by the way, the way they discovered who he was is he had his gun with him, he had his firearm with him, because he was a marshal. He had taken his Nomex turnout coat off, and he had placed it over some people to protect them from the flames. Many of the other firefighters were identified because their bodies were intact because of these coats. Ronnie was identified with his weapon. I'll say no more. His widow, Eve, incredibly courageous woman, brings herself to go down to clean out his locker, finds this file, The Towers, his beautifully obsessive file that he had kept for years. Like, you know, Paul Revere, they're coming, they're coming. In it, she finds the FDNY face sheet, the report on Ahmed Amin Rafai, this Egyptian. She brings it to the bureau, or to the FDNY, reminds them. They, then they send it to the FBI a second time, and a second time the bureau blows them off. This is after 9-11 now, understand this, okay? Now, I get the story last summer. The family opened up to me uh, generously and allowed me to tell Ronnie's story. And even after I'd gotten to know them very well, finally Eve said, you know, you should know about this case. I looked at it. I went to the fire department. I interviewed every marshal, the assistant commissioner, Kay Woods. I confirmed the story. I found out that the bureau, I even checked with people in the task force. Oh, yeah, we looked at it, but there wasn't anything to it. You know, that kind of thing. And because I'm an American before I'm a journalist, because my children live in New York City, I got this file to a man who's a top man in Homeland Security in Washington, D.C., one of the top men in the new department. Within weeks, the FBI opened the case into um, Ahmed Amin Rafai, and it's still ongoing as far as we know. Anyway, uh, that's the story of Ronnie Buka and Nancy Floyd. Um, I would love to take your questions, uh, and the, the deal is that if you ask a question in order, because this is radio and television, you have to come up to the microphone, so don't feel nervous, just come up and Kate will uh, be the... Hey, hi. Sure, what's your name? Larry Chase. Larry, great to meet you. I heard you on NPR the other day. Oh, did you? Great. This is the first book that uh, I'm allowing myself to read on this matter. you got to get angry now because now two years is too long, you know, and they're going to come back, I'm telling you, they're going to come back, and I'm going to push them on them, be ready. Thank you, Kim. Okay, Thank you, people. Yeah. Monday, Friday, and Say something. I feel a little uncomfortable. I'm not used to this. It's Monday. It's, 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 it's kind of a Colonel Mendoza thing I heard on talk radio, and it's not the Middle East, it's here, right. here yeah, in, in California. Uh -huh. And I can make it short. And it's go. Yeah. Well, go ahead. <laughs> well, I just don't want if somebody else wants to have a book sign. I, if you do that, now we can trust. You're good? Okay, good. Sorry. Okay. 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 I heard, 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 uh, he had a, he, about a, two summers people interviewing uh, people come for a half hour. He, the guy he interviewed uh, stayed only 15 minutes and he's, uh, from, uh, he's talking about uh, the Sandinistas right. uh, for bringing in soldiers to start a revolution against our country. And I wanted to say this to you uh, on the show and then the guy left. And, yeah. and well, I'll take one of my cars and maybe check my website. I'd love to talk to you. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Sure. Thank you. I heard of something else too. All right, thanks. You really mean it? Hey, you thank want you. Me Thanks a lot. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, spread just, the word. You're obviously totally well informed. Yeah. 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 This yeah. is just like, this is mainstream press. This right. is like a chief yeah. investigation. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's a neatly trimmed lawn. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, look. Just you know, send me an send me, uh, email. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work.
You look familiar. Oh, so do you, but I don't know how I would know you except from the newspapers. You look familiar, anyway. Anyway, thank you. Oh, great. Okay, thanks very much. Why don't you buy a book? Come on. I will. You came all the way. Why don't you let me sign one for you? Oh, come on. Come on. Thank you. Yeah. Look at all these books they have. I feel bad for them. Tell me your name. Suzanne with a Z, as you see. Okay. Show it off. I know the man. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Well, how, did you hear about it on the radio? Or, or? No, I saw it in the paper. Oh, great. Yeah, they did a really nice yeah, stuff. I was Scott. really fascinated and I was glad to see that somebody had actually done this kind of work. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Because I know it took a lot. Let me give you my card and just send me an email and say, you know, we met. You know, yeah. That way you can email me and I'll hook up. All right. Thank you. Good luck on your next book. Okay. We'll Thanks. see you Thank here you. next time. I hope so. Okay. Bye. If she lets me present. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just come to my website. Thank you very much. Thank you for this. So should I sign up to you? Would you mind? I'd love to. Now I put him to the full title page. Is Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. I think they people, people prefer that, don't they? Yeah, yeah. The collectors like that, don't they? Yeah. You have those little stickers? Yes, I, I usually stick them like right in there. <laughs> 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 yeah. These are the ones that are down. I'll put them down here. Don't panic. I won't mix them up. Have, um, I can repeat. Well, what's the question? Oh, yeah. Um, in one of his radio interviews, you mentioned Flight 800, and so Peter will elaborate on that. Um, I have there are two sections of my book. Lest you think I'm a wild-eyed conspiracy theorist, there are two sections of the book that I deal with the bombing in Oklahoma City and the, uh, the TWA 800 crash, and uh, I treat them. I say in the book that these are cir there's circumstantial evidence in both cases. I don't have anywhere near the weight of the evidence that I do on the general body of the road to 9/11, but the circumstantial evidence is so extraordinary in these cases. TWA 800 was a flight that took off from JFK bound for Paris on the 17th of July, 1996. The night it took off, while just months before it took off, Ramzi Youssef was on trial for the Bojinka plot that I described, I told you about. And the Bojinka plot was the plot to, to actually smuggle on board the innocuous components of a bomb trigger, essentially. He would get on the plane, put the, the, the pieces together. One involved the Casio watch that could be set up to a year in advance. He had a shaving kit with a diluted nitroglycerin looking like it was contact lens cleaner, had some wires, nine volt batteries, and he broke the bulb on a pen light flash and exposed the pig's tail, stuck it in with cotton into the nitro, which became nitrocellulose, a high explosive, set the timer, put it into the life, uh, into a, a shaving kit and stuck it under the life jacket cushion and wrote 26 C, 26K of a Boeing 747 that was bound from Manila to Cebu City in the southern Philippines and on to Narita in Japan. He did this test bombing on the 11th of December of 1994, just a couple of months before he was captured. And sure enough, uh, he did not place it far enough ahead, so it did not blow the plane, but it killed the individual uh, that was in the seat, just cut him in half, and the plane almost crash-landed. So he knew this would work, okay? Now he was going to do this times 11. They were going to have up to 11 jets. His uncle Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, um, 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 Abdul Hakim Murad, who I described, Colonel Mendoza, and a, and a fourth individual called Wali Khan Amin Shah, who was like this with bin Laden. Bin Laden called him the lion from fighting in Afghanistan. So these four guys, one guy would get on in, in Hong Kong, take the flight to Singapore, and then get off, and then the flight would go to LA. Another flight would go to Chicago. Another flight would go to New York City. And Contrary to what the feds said in the trial, I found evidence from Colonel Mendoza that the plot was much more monstrous than ever conceived because the feds claimed, they called it 48 hours of terror. They, even though they were planting the bombs over 48 hours, they weren't going to explode over the Pacific. That wouldn't have made sense. As soon as the first plane blew, they would have shut down worldwide air travel. What they planned to do is have set these weeks and months in advance so a plane could blow up flying into New York City or at a terminal in Chicago or any number of places. So any Anyway, after the jury in the Bojinka trial had heard this evidence for, for weeks, 
And, uh, and Youssef, by the way, was representing himself and not doing a bad job for a non-lawyer, but he, you know, the weight of the evidence was against him and the case was turning against him. On the very eve when, when the interrogation of Colonel Mendoza of Murad describing what I told you about the, the uh, various uh, aspects of the, 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 uh, the, the Philippine Airlines test bombing, on the very eve that evidence was gonna be introduced in trial, TWA 800 exploded blew out of the sky, no warning, okay? Uh, and uh, the next day, of course, they moved for a mistrial, okay, which the judge r refused to grant. But when the, F when the FBI, and they immediately suspected terrorism, when the FBI began examining the records pulled out of Long Island Sound, they assembled 95% of the plane at Calvert in Long Island, ironically, the same place that 1989, the guys have been firing, there was a hangar there. They put 95% of the plane together, dispelling the missile theory that you had heard that might have been a friendly fire missile. And in fact, though, found nitroglycerin, PETN, a high explosive, and RDX all over the plane, especially in the carpeting along the 25th row of the plane. Now, how did the FBI, which eventually ended up rolling over and siding with the NTSB, the NTSB always wanted to make it a mechanical issue, and they ended up in the absence of any evidence physical evidence of that wreckage decided to say there was a spark in the, ele in the fuel tank, of the center fuel tank that caused the explosion. It was like the single bullet theory in the Kennedy assassination. They, were, they had a theory and they fit the evidence to meet the theory. In the absence of that, though, the FBI rolled over. You know what the FBI's explanation was for why the high explosives got on the plane? They said there was a test by a, 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 new, a cop in St. Louis with a bomb-sniffing dog at an airport five weeks earlier, and somehow the, uh, the bait, if you will, was spilled and somehow contaminated the plane. Well, first of all, the guy used a zigzag pattern. Uh, the bait does not spill. The bait has integrity to it. And, and in fact, he told the FBI the places they found the, the explosives were nowhere near that. Second thing was that we now know, and I, this is some information I found since my book has come out, we now know that that police officer that did that test did it on an empty 747, as you can imagine. He's not going to do a test with a bomb-sniffing dog on a, you know, a flight that's... Well, when he finished his test, according to his log, 20 minutes later, the flight that became TWA-800 took off, which meant that that flight was fully catered. The crew had been on board for half an hour at least, and half of the passengers were on board at least. Yet he swore that he did it on an empty plane. There was an identical 747 at gate 50. In fact, it was the sister, almost the sister plane to this one. It rolled off the, the, the Boeing assembly plant only two planes before the flight that became TWA-800. And this guy to this day says he, he told the FBI he couldn't be sure if that was the flight. So I then interviewed Kenny Maxwell, the supervising special agent in Calverton, who said to me, Peter, it gnaws at me to this day. We found RDX on the aft cargo curtain in the cargo hold. Even if they did the bomb sniffing dog in that flight, the dog didn't go into the cargo hold. We never found the 10th cargo door. We found nine doors, suggesting it was blown. We found distress on the skin of the plane, suggesting an explosion of some kind. It eats at me to this day. I said, well, why, did you, why, why didn't you pursue this? He said, we were told to shut it down. Shut it down. You're spending too much money on this investigation and you're pulling too many men away from the war on terror investigation, essentially. Our irony of ironies. I believe, personally, Ramzi Youssef communicated to his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was going to be one of the Bojinka perpetrators, and had a device placed, at, and if not Athens, where the plane came before New York, an earlier location. And we now know from the joint inquiry report, and another astonishing thing in my book, is that the feds um, actually used a mob, made member of the a Colombo Mafia family, who was in a cell next to Youssef, to try and sting Youssef. They set up a patch-through calling system where Youssef could make outside calls, and they were going to monitor him. Well, Youssef turned the tables on them, was able to make unauthorized calls. The joint inquiry found that one of them was to his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Could he have not said, the trial is not going well, uncle, let's uh, see what you can do? And he would have achieved three things with that bomb. Ego first, and Yusuf had a massive ego. I mean, massive. Second thing, he would have potentially gotten a mistrial. And the third thing that they did achieve was that between Oklahoma City and TWA, for almost two years, they sapped almost a thousand agents of the Bureau and diverted attention away from the real hunt that should have been focusing on Osama bin Laden. Brilliant strategic move, and I believe it's related to Yusuf. Yes? Do we have a, how, how are we doing on time? It's okay? Okay.
What is your theory as to why uh, the thousand years of revenge was directed against America rather than uh, some European countries where the Crusades originated and were enacted? Is it because of our strength and world position that it would have so much greater impact than if they were to, you know, do the same thing in London or Paris, Rome? I, I, that's an excellent question. Did everyone hear that question? Uh, why, why America? If, if you're going to have a jihad against the West, why focus so much on America? Well, remember now, there had been a number of bombings in Europe over the years in the 80s and 90s. I mean, and, and there are some people that believe that when there were a number of very violent incidents in France, that the French essentially got together and made a deal with some of these terrorists to keep it off of French soil, which is, there's a theory that one of the reasons the French refused to allow U.S. flights to overfly France when President Reagan attacked Gaddafi in Libya was for this reason. But don't forget, there was Pan Am 103. There were, um, in Lockerbie, Scotland, there, there have been a number of incidents not directed to the United States. But one of the things I talk about in the book, and one of the great tragedies, is, is the, what they call in intelligence circles blowback. And blowback is the unintended consequence of a covert operation. In this case, we did a good thing in the 1980s. Uh, we tried to help the Mujahideen rebels in Afghanistan defeat the Soviets that had invaded. It was very important for us strategically. It was their Vietnam, and it was kind of the last gasp of the evil empire. And that war, which we supplied $3 billion to, matched apparently dollar for dollar by the Saudis, was considered a good war. It was bipartisan support, Democrats and Republicans, unlike the Contra War, which was the bad war back then. Well, anyway, uh, unfortunately, when the theater of operations ended and the Russians were dispatched, the Mujahideen rebels were, you know, had this incredible training. They had 500 Stinger missiles that had come from the United States. There were uh, at least what they call 14,000 Afghan Arabs, non-Afghans um, who'd come from, there were blue-eyed Chechens, there were black South Africans, there were Filipinos. It, this was the Spanish Civil War of Islam, if you will. Only as, as um, a, a writer pointed out, after the original Spanish Civil War, people like Hemingway went to Paris to write books, and these guys decided to focus on America and blow things up. Uh, and I do think that a part, a measure of that was that, and with respect to bin Laden particularly, the, um, uh, the fact that we were the, the big guy on the hill. We symbolized the ultimate in Western power. And it is the West that they have such a virulent hatred for. They want to return these extremists to the 7th century caliphate, uh, the Islam of what they perceive to be the Islam of the 7th century. And we represent, you know, tolerance, freedom, uh, women's rights, you know, other things that are anathema to them. And, and they focus on the United States with great ferocity. And as I say in the book, and I, uh, my last chapter is all about Iraq, I believe that the danger has increased since the invasion of Iraq. And, I, and I'll be happy to discuss that if you want. But I think one of the things I do in my book is I point out that there is little or no evidence of a connection with, and the president even admitted this a few weeks ago, that between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda with respect to 9-11, little or no evidence. Yet now that we've decapitated the, the dictator, there are, there's evidence that Al-Qaeda people are infiltrating Iraq and aligning with the Ba'ath Party. So the, the threat to America is actually, I think, greater. And it's not just my opinion. Colleen Rowley the courageous um, lawyer from the Minneapolis office who was put on the, one of the Time Magazine Persons of the Year for standing up to Director Mueller, Colleen Rowley uh, wrote a letter to him February 26th of this year, and she said, I'm paraphrasing, I fear what will happen from the increased danger if we invade Iraq. I'm not sure the Bureau is prepared to protect us, and I'm not sure you've communicated that to the President. So this is Colleen Rowley on the inside. There's Fran. Fran? Hi, mine is a follow-up question then. How come with 100 senators and 435 congresspeople, couldn't the, some, a, a Nancy or a Ronnie have found somebody with the White House's ear, somebody who's close to the White House who could then bring this story to them and have, because obviously they can say to the FBI, hey fellas, let's do something, or is this a naive question? It's not naive, but I think you have to put yourself back into the moment. First of all, they were in the middle of this. They were ground troops, if you will, in the war on terror. She was a junior agent, and a street agent or a brick agent. Uh, she had already basically had her career ruined just by challenging a senior official in the New York office, let alone doing an end run and going to Washington. Ronnie Buka was had great respect for the military and the chain of command. And he thought, you know, if we, if we go to the Bureau, 
will get results, and he tried. You know, Ronnie Buka is, is so beloved in the U.S. military, not just in the fire department, that the first POW camp in Iraq this spring was named Camp Buka after Ronnie Buka. That's, that's who this guy was, but he also respected the chain of command. And, and uh, look, one of the things I do, I devote this, I, I dedicate this book to the, to the agents of first impression, the uniformed cops, the firefighters, the EMS workers, and, and the people who are on the ground. Uh, continually, this is not an attack on the FBI. This is an attack on the institution of small-minded management in the FBI. There's an incredibly bifurcated system in the Bureau that you get to a certain point, you get to GS-14, and if you want to advance, you just can't be, you can't be a street agent anymore. You can't stay in your area of expertise. If you love terrorism and you want to stay in it your whole career, but you have a family and you have to make some more money, you have to raise your hand, put in for management, and then you move from Washington into a field office back and forth, and you move up the food chain, and forever after that in your career, you're management. You're not a street agent anymore, and you're judging the work of other people who are on the front lines. Now, Carson Dunbar may have had the best in of intentions, but he had no terrorism experience. He hadn't been in the field in years, and I apparently was threatened by Nancy uh, Fourth right attitude, uh, and uh, and did not trust Salem. Had you know, Salem even said he's treating me like a raghead. Had you know, and therefore you had management making this decision. And another question I asked, though, okay, so so he cuts Salem, so Salem leaves because of he's being forced to testify, etc. Why in the fall of '92, when when they're begging Nancy and she's communicating this back, why didn't they do the surveillance? I mean, I have you can't believe how visible Ramsi Youssef was. In the fall of night, Salema, the little, the little Palestinian driver, had three traffic accidents. At one point, Yusuf was injured, put in the hospital. He's using an illegal uh, phone card, charged $18,000 $18, of illegal phone charges to order the chemicals for the bomb from the hospital. Uh, there are calls from Mahmoud Abu Alima, the big redhead, who the FBI had searched his apartment two years earlier. There are calls on his home phone from the Trade Center to Ramzi Youssef's bomb factory on Pamrapo Avenue in Jersey City. I mean, in retrospect, when you go back and look at it, it's astonishing. If they had just done basic Title III wiretap warrants, they would have had these guys. Another amazing thing is that Youssef, when he slipped into the country, came in with a guy named Mohammed Ajaj. And Ajaj was designed to be the smokescreen, okay? They fly, by the way, these guys travel first class. They pay for everything in cash. Youssef was a high liver. He, uh, I have a whole chapter about Manila. I call it the Lounge Lizards of Terror. He and his uncle were out every night with bar girls, you know, peeling off the, you know, living high, okay? At one point, Khalid uh, was infatuated by a young female dentist who he bragged that he, uh, he, that he took private aircraft a lot. So he actually hired a helicopter one day and they flew over and buzzed this woman's office and, and he called her on his cell phone and, and waved at her. You know, I mean, this is the kind of stuff these guys were doing while they're plotting to kill, plotting mass murder, at, you know, during the day. Well, anyway, um, so Ramzi Youssef uh, is, um, uh, and these guys are, um, you know, so visible, it was just extraordinary. Ajaj comes in with Youssef and he has a suitcase full of bomb books, videos of suicide bombings. He's got seven passports, I think it was seven, maybe five. And one of them is a Swedish passport, which he's got his picture crudely pasted over a blue-eyed Swedish person, and because they intended for him to be caught. And as soon as they grabbed him, he's screaming, yelling, making a big noise. Ramsey, meanwhile, slips in and, and asks for political asylum, even though they both flew in. Now, here's another case, and I have like seven instances in this book where women almost broke this plot. Now, not just Nancy Floyd, but I'll tell you about a couple of others. There's a female INS agent who says to her boss, this guy is wrong. He came in on the flight with that other guy we just arrested. I think we, gotta, we should detain this guy. There's something about him I don't like, blah, blah, blah. They've got the same ID from the same center in, in Tucson, Arizona. You know, And the guy says, look, he took the last bed at Varick Street. That's it. Just let him go. Give him a walk-in 240 for him. So give him a... And she said, sir, are you... Yeah, boom. And so Ramzi Youssef, welcome to the United States, Mr. Youssef. You have, an you have an asylum hearing on such and such a date. Oh, I will be there. I will be there. Right. Okay. So in December now, after Youssef misses his hearing, understand, he could be grabbed at any minute. He's an illegal alien. They could grab him at any second. Okay. Ajaj, who was then arrested, 
is in federal jail in Otisville, okay? He's in federal, you know, lockup. And he actually makes a petition through his court-appointed lawyers to get his books, his bomb materials back. And he and Youssef are talking to each other through a burger joint in Texas. They're using the two-way calling feature on Pac Bell, and they have a, 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 a guy in Texas at a burger joint. They're calling there, and then the calls are being forwarded to Ra Ramsey at the bomb factory in Jersey City, and they're using codes to discuss it. And Youssef says, Could I, I, I need those manuals. I, can, can we get the manuals? So he has, a judge from prison has his lawyers petition to get the manuals, and the judge grants them the manuals back, to get the manuals back. Oh. Now, what, did, any, did anybody in the Bureau think to show up at that hearing and protest or monitor that? Or, because if they had then monitored him in prison, which they were allowed to do without a warrant, they would have had him talking to Ramzi Youssef as he built the World Trade Center bomb. I mean, there are a dozen of these jaw-dropping things in this book that when you read them, you are not going to believe it. One of the biggest problems is the FBI has been lionized by Hollywood, by, you know, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., the G-men. And we have this vision of the FBI as this invincible crime fighting force. When you read this book, it will make you angry. It will make you afraid. And the whole purpose of this is to channel that fear into results. Call your congressman, call your senator, and make sure that the Bureau reforms before the next one. That's my whole purpose in writing this book. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for your courage in using your talent to put together this book. It's amazing. Um, secondly, do you feel there's an impact on the fact that the Bin Laden family, after 9-11, was detained for a week and then escorted out of the country? And do you think there's an impact on the fact that the Bin Laden family has so many networks and relationships amongst American business and institutions? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, my next book is going to involve an individual who I, I treat in chapters 21 and 34 of this book, Harry Ellen. Harry Ellen, if you, if you go to my website, peterlance.com, and you go to the upper left corner, you'll see a story in today's New York Times, yesterday's Washington Post, and the AP in the last two days about Harry Ellen. Harry Ellen is this extraordinary individual who was, his grandfather, step-grandfather was Jewish, but he converted to Islam in the early 90s and began an initiative into Palestine, to Gaza, to try and bring medical aid to the Palestinians. And the FBI actually piggybacked on that and invested some money for intelligence reasons so they could, you know, keep track of what was going on. Well, Harry ended up having a falling out with his control officer, and it's a long story, but the guy basically threatened to blow his cover with the Palestinians. Now, look at all the brouhaha over just blowing the cover of the ambassador's wife, who is not to take anything away from her, but she's inside an embassy. This guy is meeting with Hamas, the Islamic Jihad, and these terror groups, you know, in order to get safe passage for Jewish doctors to go over there. And an FBI agent, according to Harry, threatened to blow his cover and did blow his cover, okay? Well, Harry actually, his control agent, Ken Williams, was the guy who became famous for sending the famous Phoenix memo two months before 9-11. The Phoenix memo said we should be looking at flight schools, but it was only two months. I have in my book the fact that Harry Ellen put Ken Williams onto Islamic suspicious pilots in Arizona in 1996, okay? Now... The reason to answer your question about bin Laden, I'm going to do my next book. Harry's life is a Jean Le Carré novel, but it's real, okay? What happened to him? And Harry, uh, part of that was the fact that he dealt with Osama bin Laden during the Bank of Credit and Commerce scandal in the 80s. You remember that? BCCI, the famous bank? And bin Laden then, according to Harry, was wearing, you know, uh, Italian suits and it was like a playboy. And he's this international banker. And so we're going to go back and we're going to look at the origins of the bin Laden family, the connection of the bin Laden family to U.S. interests, which I'm not going to be specific about right now, and, and that, but that is an astonishing thing if you think about it. You have the greatest mass murder in American history. The bin Laden family members, if not material witnesses, you could at least make an argument that they might be material witnesses, yet, as we saw in Craig Unger's recent piece in Vanity Fair, were re reportedly, and I have not confirmed this so I can't say, just secondhand, spirited out of the country, allowed to leave at a point where the rest of the world was locked down, the rest of the country. So so there are many unanswered questions. Another one of the big unanswered questions of 9-11, the allegations of insider trading, that there are puts on the stock of uh, United and American that were six times greater, people betting that the stock would go down, six times greater. And I've also learned that now that there were puts on this, the reinsurers, Swiss RE and AXA advisors, which were the reinsurers of the trade center. Now that's a crosshair. You've got, if you have people betting that the airlines that were the two airlines that hit the towers would go down, and then you have the fact that the tower, the reinsurers stock would go down, that's a crosshair, which suggests that somebody knew. Now, the easiest thing in the world is to track who bought stock, right? 
Why two years after the fact does, does the American public not know the results of that investigation? Who bought that stock? Was it the bin Laden group as was suspected originally? And if it was, were they given, you know, was, does anybody on the Security Exchange Commission know? There was a, there was a, this is one of those myths that I'm going to chase down, that there was a certain kind of software called Promise. And if you think about it, Promise software was a, was a brilliant notion. The idea is it's an intelligence software that, that, that gives information on on um, catastrophic changes in stocks. Because if you think about stocks, they're a beautiful barometer, an intelligence tool of what's going on in the world. So this promised software, the developer once ended up, I think, suing the US government, alleging that the software was taken by the US intelligence agencies. In any event, why would they have not known if six times the stock on two American airlines was people were betting against it? And six times, why wouldn't that have shown up in our intelligence agencies? I don't know the answer to that, and I don't know if these allegations are even true. That is going to be part of the inquiry of this next book. Thanks again. I really respect what you've done here. Um, from what I've heard about those put options, the uh, the um, profit was never claimed, but I'm sure you'll investigate that, that those put options never claimed. But anyway, I just have a few questions here. Um, I've read that um, there's a relationship between the Pakistani CIA and our CIA, and that the head of the Pakistani CIA wired Mohammed Atta to lead hijacker $100,000 the week prior to 911. And um, I was just, I'll sit down after I have a couple questions, and I was wondering if you could just comment on that at all, about if you know if there's a relationship know. that exists. I don't know. That is something I don't, I don't have any knowledge of, but it provokes an answer that's related to what you're saying. If you, if you don't mind, I can, I can answer that in a different way. But go ahead if you have another question. I, no, go I'll ahead. You something else if you yeah, go and ahead. And then have you ever investigated exactly what happened at the Pentagon that day? Because even in your book, you, uh, the Pentagon appears to have a hole approximately 40 feet wide and a 757 has a 150 foot wingspan. I have and not so, focused on the Pentagon. Okay, um, another uh, aspect of the, my next book is going to be the day of. Okay. Uh, and that's an area that I just didn't have time to look yeah, into now. Yeah, um, just, just going to mainstream okay. press and looking at pictures from September 12th, the whole does not match, is not commensurate at all with what happened with the World Trade Towers. That there's no de uh, de rubbish tr uh, debris trail or anything. Um, finally, um, and also, have you investigated why jets weren't scrambled according to standard operating procedure of the it's FAA? All, it's that, all fodder for the next that's book. That's the next book. Yeah, because okay. I, I, what I did was I focused on the road to 9-11 and the question of could we prevented it, and then the, the more specific and even larger questions that many of the victims' families are asking is what happened that day? Why did jets scramble from Otis Air Force Base on Cape Cod? Why did it take X number of minutes to reach Payne Stewart's jet exactly. uh, when he was dying and, and it took was so it, long to defend right. these two towers? Okay. So these are really valid okay. questions. And, then, and one last um, and assuming there's this massive intelligence failure, and then there are also these other failures at 911. Have you thought at all or speculated how high the knowledge of this might have gone, um, besides just FBI incompetence? And well, but otherwise, thank you yeah, very much. I'll you raise all, all every question he raises is an excellent question, and part of, you know, like I say, the part of the line of inquiry. But one thing I wanted to mention that's apropos of his question about the Pakistani. Remember, you know, we, we have these allies in the war on terror, and we want to make sure that our allies are, you know, doing the job with us. And one of the most astonishing things that came out in Bill Gertz's book, Breakdown, and I say at the very end of this book, by the way, that I stood on the shoulders of giants. I, every book that was done in, prior to, 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 to this book, I read and I sourced in the body of the book as well as the end notes. There are a thousand end notes leading to some people to think that we should have called it a thousand end notes for revenge. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, one of the things that Bill Gertz reported and then the LA Times followed up on, and this came from Bob Baer, that extraordinary ex-CIA agent who has written two remarkable books. Um, the, uh, when uh, um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, okay, the, the, master, the, the FBI self-confessed mastermind of 9-11 who, in my, you know, carried out the plot of his, of his nephew Ramzi, he is in, in Qatar or gutter, Q A T A R, uh, in, in 1997 December. The FBI finds out about it. They send the hostage rescue team, the elite unit, over to grab him. And the Qatari officials say, wait a minute, let's go and we want to make sure where he is and we'll, we'll just wait here, we'll call you. Well, they cool their heels and by the time they got there, he was gone. He'd been spirited out of the country. One of the individuals that reportedly spirited him out of the country was one um, Abdullah bin 
Khalid Al Thani, Abdullah bin Khalid Al Thani, who was described originally as a wealthy uh, Qatari businessman in Bill Gertz's book, the LA Times, which has done some remarkable reporting, advanced the story this spring and and astonishingly reported that Khalid uh, bin Al Thani is actually a minister in the Qatari government. And Qatar, or Qatar, as you know, is where the U.S. Central Command was located during the course of the invasion. So you have an example. If, and, and Bob, and by the way, uh, Richard Clark, the former terrorism czar under both. Uh, uh, President Clinton and President Bush uh, was told this by the LA Times. He said, that's astonishing if that's true. If that's true, uh, you know, he was like shocked to hear this. So you have a situation where we are invading a country based, according to the Ameri what was told the American people, that not only did they have weapons of mass destruction, but they were allied with bin Laden in the attacks of 9-11. And much of the support of the American people in that invasion was a result of thinking, we're going to help solve crack the 9-11 plot and bring down al-Qaeda, right? Yet, as I say in the book, little or no evidence of that, and yet the, the, the country where our central command is located has in its government an official who helped to spirit the mastermind of 9-11 out of the country. Now that is astonishing, okay? Why hasn't anyone addressed that fact? That is just, and that is one of the dozen or so You've got to be kidding things that I came across when I was doing this thing and I had to double check and triple check. And, I, and I, you know, after a while, I kept saying to myself, is this incompetence, uh, is it negligence, or is there something else going on? And I think in the beginning, back in 1989, there were actually three things happening. In 1989, I think these guys were allowed to shoot on Calvert and Long Island because they were our buddies from the Afghan war. And, and that was good at that point, okay? And then I think there was a, a level of incompetence and arrogance that didn't appreciate how a loosely organized group of, you know, um, quote, ragheads, as they referred to by some people in the FBI, could have done this. And then by the time uh, you had the Philippines evidence where Colonel Mendoza turned it over, I think we're into cover-up mode at that point. I think people were starting to say, my God, we could have stopped this guy in 1995. We've got to separate Khalid Sheikh Mohammed from his nephew because if we really draw the dots that, that I have connected in this book, and I have challenged Director Mueller, and I challenge him now, I hope he watches C-SPAN, to come on and de de debate me or just challenge anything in my book. Um, if I'm wrong, I stand corrected, and I want to see that I'm wrong, but I connected these dots. I'm an individual reporter. I don't have subpoena power. I used a reporter's notebook, a phone, and Google. Okay, and tenacity, and that's how I wrote this book. And uh, and anyway, Peter I Lance's latest book is "A Thousand Years for Revenge: International Terrorism and the FBI: The Untold Story." It's published by Regan Books online at HarperCollins.com.